I had uh, gone on my lunch break to the Albemarle County uh, Clerk's Office for a number of months to look through property records. Um, And if you've ever been in there, there's a back room that is filled floor to ceiling with these giant books that look like wizard tomes. Uh, They're huge, they're heavy, they're old. Uh, They go all the way back to the 1700s. Um, There's will books, there's, there's every sort of record imaginable, but the property records were of particular interest to me because uh, they tell a story of, of land ownership um, and land movement uh, throughout generations of, of Albemarleans. And also, uh, you know, what was Albemarle has gradually been annexed to become Charlottesville. Um, and so I was interested in both of those, but particularly uh, looking for instances post-emancipation of uh, racially restrictive clauses and deeds. And so looking at uh, subdevelopments as they went in in the early 1900s, um, the earliest one I found on these lunch break visits was 1897, I and mean, it was just northeast of Court Square, so right in the heart of Charlottesville. But uh, these clauses uh, restricted the sale of property to white people only. And in doing so, they prevented African Americans from um, not only purchasing the property and living there, but uh, as a result, uh, accumulating generational wealth. And what I premise and hypothesize is is, uh, a significant factor in the disparity we see along racial lines at every life outcome. So uh, that that generational wealth not only just affects your pocketbook and your bottom line in terms of economic value, but also health care, education, access to resources in terms of criminal justice and navigating law enforcement and legal systems. Uh, obviously, uh, yeah, your ability to uh, thrive healthfully too, um, and uh, and so these lunch visits would, uh, you know, gradually add more and more. Uh, the map got bigger and bigger in terms of where all of these racially restricted neighborhoods were. And at that point, I had enough. I had, uh, you know, probably upwards of 30 or 40 different neighborhoods over the course of 50 years that I knew that there was more to it and that it really needed a scientifically methodological approach. It just couldn't be lunch hour visits. Um, And so, you know, when the HEAL Fund grants came available, I said, well, this would be a perfect way to start, really jumpstart this and get a scientifically backed and and methodologically sound approach going with the idea that it wouldn't just be me, that it would really have a community facing and public portion as well. And so that was where the Heal Fund really came in is to design that and to help augment exactly what that was going to look like.